Hello, Rabbi Menes Friedman. Thank God it's Tuesday. Um, Thank God it's after the eclipse. <laughs> well, see, I'm kind of disappointed. <laughs> I mean, we've been waiting for this eclipse, and there was so much stuff going on in the media, on, the, on YouTube, on all the social media, and everybody was waiting and so excited. Something is going to happen. This is... This is, this is uh, definitely uh, coming from God, this is a sign, maybe we're going to wake up, or it, the sun is going to go away, Mashiach is going to appear, and then we were so in anticipation of this event, and yep. the eclipse passed, Mashiach is not here, and the disappointment sets in. <laughs> Are we overplaying this coming of Mashiach? Are we just too overexcited? Are we uh, setting ourselves up a little bit for disappointment maybe we should rethink our attitude a little bit or maybe something else no maybe we should be disappointed <laughs> <laughs> it's a possibility it's one of the options oh, we can't stop being disappointed because then we're giving up the ship but what, what what was what was the excitement about the eclipse? I mean, what was that? A sign from heaven? Are we still looking for signs from heaven? I yes. thought it was our job to bring Mashiach. <laughs> it is significant, by the way. The day of the eclipse, we were reading. All of us were reading in the Rambam, the daily Rambam. How Avraham, our grandfather, came to uh, recognize God. And the Rambam uses these words. He came along as a young man and he looked up at the sky. And he asked himself, who is the mover behind all this movement? And he came to re recognize the true God. In other words, look up to the sky and you'll discover something. We don't look up often enough. Sometimes we just look down at life. Sometimes we just look forward. But all we need to do is look up, turn our attention to something higher, and we will discover some very great things. So the one thing that the uh, that the eclipse did, it turned everyone upward. Everyone was craning their necks, looking up. What did we see? The sun was covered, completely covered, a complete eclipse, almost complete. That's not the point. The point is, who's in charge of all of that? hope it did bring out some inspiration in people look up is already is already an improvement it's much better than looking down Rabbi Friedman from our past conversations um, in one of our conversations you said that Mashiach is gonna come when everybody is gonna really really want him to come when everybody is gonna say okay we have had it with everything up to here <laughs> and no one can pretty much um, do anything for us other than Mashiach and what for whatever it was okay so Mashiach we don't see him here right now um, and we'll talk about it in a couple of seconds maybe we're just not looking in the right direction <laughs> but uh, but definitely we saw this collective drive that everybody wants this something everybody wants a change everybody is looking up like you said everybody is it's 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 not on the tv it's not in the social media it's it's up there and everybody wants this exactly do we know exactly what it is we talk about it but i don't think we're still comprehending it fully and maybe this is a good opportunity to revisit this topic as well because i think the more we talk about it the more excited we get and the more we're going to want it but realistically that 
that's the good thing that that we saw that people want this not a different president not better economy <laughs> those things would be lovely but that's not where it's at anymore yeah well looking up it that's huge well what exactly does it mean does it mean looking for an angel to solve my problems looking for God to perform a miracle for us I'm afraid that most people think that that's what it means look up the solution will come miraculous no looking up means find the higher truth why, why are you why do you exist why were you born you can look down and say yeah life is a misery and it doesn't have a good purpose or you can look forward to human growth development maybe in a few million years human beings will evolve into a higher intelligence or a better quality being or look up look up meaning find the purpose find the divine reason for your life not not beg for a miracle we're, we're gonna have miracles they're happening all the time but that doesn't change us internally so look up means raise your awareness to a higher topic so what what do we think of Mashiach a miracle person a healer of all flesh or a wise teacher who will enlighten us so again are we looking to uh, to be relieved of pain yeah <laughs> that wouldn't hurt are we looking for greater prosperity and for peace on earth and utopian existence oh, yeah that wouldn't hurt but when do we look up and see what God needs of us when do we stop thinking only of ourselves and consider the purpose for which he created us that's looking up and that's what we need from Mashiach. We don't need another lecture on be nice, love everybody, and get along. We need Mashiach to reveal the higher reality of who we are, what we are, why we are. That's looking up. Rebbe Friedman, the Rebbe said that Mashiach is here he said that what did he mean by that is that is that where Hasidism came about is, is that what he meant what did he mean by saying that Mashiach is already here I'm only speculating it can mean a number of things. We've always believed in Mashiach for 3,000 years. Mashiach is here could mean it is now time for Mashiach. And now the question is only how to reveal him. But it's already time. So it's not can we do anything exceptional so that we deserve Mashiach? We don't have to deserve its time. So the time has arrived. The time for Mashiach is here. So tune in. Pay attention. That's, that's one possibility. The other possibility is we have satisfied all requirements. Whatever needed to happen for Mashiach to come has happened. And yet Mashiach is not here. So the Rebbe was kind of lobbying with God, like, now what? Mashiach is here. 
So why is he unknown? Why is the effect not being felt? Because he must be here. We already did everything. The third possibility is the Rebbe was arguing based on Torah. According to Torah, the predictions, the conditions, they've all been satisfied. So, in the space of Torah, in the Torah world or universe, Mashiach is here. Now we just have to make it physical. In other words, he's here in principle. Now we have to make him here in the concrete. So, it can't be that the Rebbe was just teasing because he was so passionate about it and to him it was so real that he was seeing it. Maybe he gave us more credit than we deserve and was convinced that if he could see it, then we could see it. Well, not quite. <laughs> we have a few, a few things to learn before we can see what he sees. So, there's no question that we've turned the corner in some way. It's not like our grandparents who believed in Moshiach. No, something substantial has changed. And it's not even a question of believing anymore. It's a question of making it happen. So the wonderful, impressive, spiritual greatness of Jews walking into the gas chamber singing, I believe in the coming of Mashiach. Awesome, but too spiritual. <laughs> We're past that stage. Now Mashiach has to be concrete, down to earth, and, and universal. Not, not the property of the believers, like some special group who are into Mashiach, that, that, that's nowhere, that's nothing. So let's take a look at what, um, what the Rambam says about Avraham. Everyone in his generation believed in idols. What did he see, what did he understand that no one else understood? It's not like there weren't intelligent people. And yet it eluded them, and only he saw it. So here's what the Rambam says. It's fascinating. In the times of, of Enosh, people started thinking that God put the world under control of certain forces. Without sunlight, there would be no life. Without water, there would be no life. They understood nature probably better than we do today, despite all our technology and so on. They knew that without these forces, there would be no life, or there'd be no planet. These forces are God's ministers who are ministering for him and keeping his creation going. Wouldn't it be appropriate to honor the king's ministers? Not the minister is the king, of course not. But being a minister of the king deserves some recognition. So they simply assumed that God would be pleased if we honored his ministers. 
like a president would be pleased if we respected his police officers. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And of course, there's a hierarchy of respect. You respect the police officer, you respect the governor, you are the mayor, and then the governor, and then the, the senator, and then the uh, administration at the time, and then the president himself. That's how idolatry first began. No one said that the son was God, but the son was God's biggest minister. So sun worship was very popular. But sun worship didn't mean denial of God. So it, it makes our ancestors, who were idolaters, a little less brainless. They didn't claim that the sun is God or that the moon is God, or that they have the fertility God. They recognized that these forces are in charge of certain aspects of life without which there would be no life. So when you're in a restaurant and you're served a good meal, is it inappropriate to thank the waiter? I mean, he's just a waiter. He's not the owner, he's not the chef. But he brings to you what you need. So, yeah, it's appropriate to say thank you and even maybe leave him a tip. (laughs) (laughs) Or you won't be invited back to the restaurant. (laughs) Time went by and some dishonest people, see, that was an honest mistake. So idolatry began as an as an innocent misunderstanding. Why that's a misunderstanding, we'll get to in a second. The next stage was that people started preaching that they heard from the uh, from the idol that the idol demands certain things. And if not, They'll get angry, and they will withhold life. So you better sacrifice your firstborn, or the rains will never come. The third stage was false prophets, who came and said, God demands that you honor his servants, his messengers. And by then, all thought of God had been removed and forgotten. Now Avraham comes along, and everyone is worshiping idols, thinking that God wants it, that the idol wants it, and that the idol deserves it. See, those are the three stages. The first stage was the idol deserves respect. King's minister. Second stage was the idol demands respect. And the third stage is God demands respect for his idol. Avraham looks up and he asks himself what makes the planets move? What set this motion into motion? Things don't move themselves, by themselves, which is obviously true, simple, a simple uh, fact. Well, everyone else came to the conclusion that the sun makes things grow and keeps it warm, water keeps things alive, the earth is fertile. It's the that's that's what makes everything happen. His question was, what made the sun happen? 
what gives the sun its ability to move? In other words, the big mistake is, yes, you tip the waiter, even though he's just a waiter, but the reason you tip him is because he does it willingly. He took the job willingly. He brought you the food willingly. He's not a robot. You don't thank a robot. They attributed to the sun not only power, but also will, volition. You thank the, the sun because the sun is doing its job willingly. And that's not true. The sun can't do anything willingly. It can't even move willingly. Something has to move it. So how could it deserve praise? So what he came to the realization is not that there is an original creator. Everyone knew that. The conclusion he came to was that only the original creator has free will. Everything in creation does not. And if it doesn't have free will, why are you thanking it? You're talking to a wall. Thanking the wall for being a wall? That's foolish. So to put it in, in simple language, in Jewish language, Avraham discovered the oneness of God, the uniqueness of God. God is unique because he operates by choice. Nothing else does. Have we forgotten that? We keep on thinking we, we think. have free choice. Ah. That's true. God gave us free choice, which means we are more powerful than nature. We are therefore responsible for nature. We can change nature. We can certainly complete nature. But we are superior to the forces that give us life. That's a radical idea. Because I do have free choice, meaning I am created in God's image, he has free choice, I have free choice, unlike every other thing in creation, which is not in God's image, only the human being. So that does two things. First of all, it tells us what's real. And second of all, it puts us in charge of what's real. That's what should happen when you look up. <laughs> to look up and see that the sun has been blocked out for a few minutes. What are you excited at? Why is that exciting? Did the sun plan this? Did the moon scheme <laughs> to find a way to block out the mighty sun? No. But when you look up with your free choice, you can change everything. Rabbi Friedman, I think the eclipse is very humbling to people. Just like the earthquake, <laughs> which happened, took place on Friday a little earthquake in New York, which I personally, I'm sorry, didn't even feel, but uh, a lot of people got overly excited. Oh, look, look, God is doing this. God is closing off the sun. God is doing so many things. So I think people just are very humbled by these events, understanding that, you know, we're so small and we're not in control. Um, so what you're saying is a little bit different right now that we do so, sort of have some sort of a control. So, do we have more control over bringing Mashiach, over revealing Mashiach? 
And if so, uh, please give us the formula. Tell us, you know, <laughs> all the steps that we need to take because realistically, um, I think we're so super ready. I can't, I can't give you a, a quote or an authoritative, uh, but if I had to guess, I would say we need to stop using God and start serving God. That would be a major, major change. Stop asking God for things and start providing for God what he created you for and what he's waiting for. Now, people often ask for a blessing. Can you give me a blessing? My answer is, you should be a blessing, not beg for a blessing. Be a blessing to your family. Be a blessing to your community. Be a blessing to your city, to your country, to, to, to all of creation. Stop looking for a blessing. Become the blessing. Stop asking God for goodies and gifts and help. and Start serving God. You know what's going to happen if people make that decision? They're going to say, how in the world do I serve God? Okay, I want to. I'm not greedy anymore. I'm not, I'm not egotistical anymore. It's not all about me. Yes, I'm ready to serve God. How do you serve God? That's where Mashiach steps in. If we want to serve God truly, we need Mashiach to teach us how. Because so far, all we've been taught was, you need God, and there, here's how you get blessings and goodies from Him. And when it doesn't happen, we become very frustrated. Barbara Friedman, I have to mention um, something right now. I have to give a huge plug to basehana.org because the incredible teachers that are there that actually shine light daily, daily uh, through the wisdom and their knowledge and, and just their, their great personalities and, and the joy with which they do what they do. And yesterday was probably one of the best things I've heard. I hear something amazing every day, but ye yesterday really resonated, and I want to share it with uh, everyone who's listening and watching right now. So, E.T. said yesterday that we see, we see evil so clearly these days, and the reason why we see it is because we're becoming holy, because unless we would be, we would not be holy, we weren't able to see it, but if we're c going above it, and we're seeing it clearly, that is a really very um, big sign that the humanity is um, getting this holy status, finally. So I found this to be very empowering, very positive, very hopeful, and I definitely want to share it with everybody. And if everybody wants to get more of this kind of wisdom, it's basehana.org so much good good things are happening over there so um and 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 we're looking for the signs but i found this to be probably the best sign it pointed out the best sign that mashiach is near is that if we can see evil that means we're getting to be holy to the holy level um we not only see it but we're sickened by it That means you're sensitized. We can't tolerate it. We can't justify it. We can't we can't accept it anymore. But we used to. Yeah, what are you gonna do? People are bad. 
Oh, we didn't realize how bad. <laughs> <laughs> but we're still a little helpless about it because it still seems like it's not completely in our control. We're sickened by it. This is an emotion. But physically, what can we physically do to eradicate it? It seems like we still depend on those who are in control. And that's also a very upsetting portion of the situation. So, you know, public opinion does have some influence. Certainly not enough. But it does have an influence. If the public was willing to tolerate more evil, oh, there is no limit to how evil people in power can be. So the reason that the evil is contained to the degree that it is, is because they're afraid of public opinion. So public opinion has been demanding an improvement in certain areas. A little more transparency. A little more honesty. A little less greed. These are all good things. It's not the most powerful argument. Because if everybody is supposed to be looking out for themselves, which we all believe, then why are you so shocked if those who are looking out for themselves are doing it at your disadvantage? In other words, the principle behind all of this behavior, it's every man for himself. Your success is up to you. You can be whatever you want. Doesn't that sound a little... Uh, immoral grab whatever you can oh no no you're grabbing too much what are you doing don't make me crazy so don't tell me I should be selfish and then condemn me for being greedy if we had a stronger clearer expectation the powers that be would have to obey the stronger expectation has to be. It doesn't matter what you think, what you need, what you want, what you're good at. Is this what God wants? And there's no squirming around that. <clears throat> so, again, if we shifted from self-centered to God-centered, we would have a different world. But God-centered needs to be understood. You can't just say it. Now here's a big problem. The most devoted servants of God don't serve Him. They're serving themselves. Because they are convinced and they believe and they preach and they teach. All the good you do is for your own benefit. It doesn't benefit God at all. So who are you serving? Some say, well, yeah, it does serve him in the sense that he asked you to do it and you're doing it. So if he asks you to do it, is it because it benefits him? Oh, no, 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 no. It doesn't benefit him at all. Now we've got a really messy situation. I'm serving God because I'm doing what he wants. But does it benefit him in any way? What he wants? No. So there's some disconnect between God's want and God. God wants it, but it's not him. So again, who are you serving? It's, fr it's frustrating. And under the surface, it leaves a bad taste. Am I really serving him by doing what's best for me? Oh, 
how do I know what's best for me? Yeah, God told me. That doesn't mean you're serving him by, by following his good advice. You're serving yourself. No, he is serving you by giving you good advice that is best for you. Rabbi Friedman, you know, I believe we're in a position right now that we, we're there. We really want to serve God and we are no longer about ourselves. But we're still here and we don't see him. So yes, we want to serve him. But while we're here, we don't we don't want to be sick. We don't want to be impoverished. We don't want to be any of these things. While we're here, we still, you know, not our needs, his needs. He made all of this happen. So we're like in, in a little bit of uh, between uh, a rock and a hard place because yes, yes, we're ready. We want to, but um, are we given the opportunity? Are we giving, I mean, is, is this like the final test? How do we deal with this, with this situation? Yeah, yeah, you're exactly right. That's why I said before, what do we need Mashiach for? When we decide that it's time to serve God, we, we don't know how. We don't even know what it means to serve Him. To benefit Him? How can you benefit God? See, that's why we need Mashiach. But also, the teachings of the Baal Shem Tev were a, a, pre a prelude, a prologue to the teachings of Mashiach. So the Baal Shem Tev already began this awareness, introduced this awareness. Don't do it for you, do it for him. And everybody said, wow! Wow, do it for him. Yeah. Uh, how do you do for him when he doesn't need anything? So that's where we're at. We're ready to serve him. We're not told how or that it's even possible. So it is a little frustrating. I don't want to serve myself anymore. I'm done with that. You know, if one more minister, preacher, lecturer tells me how to improve my life, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> I don't want to hear it anymore. I fell for it too often. I'm not falling for it anymore. Oh, do this and your life will be perfect. How many times have we heard that? And we're still hearing it. Take this pill. Take this mushroom. <laughs> yeah. Everything will be good. Change this government. Change this uh, community. Cha no more. Not because it doesn't work, but because that's not the right goal. Don't make my life better. That is egocentric. What can I do for God? Rabbi Friedman, thank you so, so much. I think this is a question that we need to let people mull over all the time, think about it. We are definitely um, all on the same page, we have had it. We want things to be different. And the big question is, in accordance to whom? And obviously, it's in accordance to the one who, are, <laughs> who rules the world, who created everything. So, hopefully, we get to think and contemplate exactly on that um, as much as possible. And, Rabbi Friedman, thank you. Thank you so much for the positivity, for the directness, um, for making the goal clear and um, for giving us so much um, information and wisdom that supports all of this. Thank you so, so much for this time that you allocate for us weekly. It's, it's priceless. Thank God it's Tuesday. Almost weekly. <laughs> we, miss a, we miss a few here and there. It's all right. More or less, we're, 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 it's fantastic. It's fantastic. It's a blessing. Thank you so, so much. Have a wonderful week, and hopefully next week we have a lot of 
uh, positive things to speak about. Only good news. Thank you so, so much. Amen.